Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, and today I'm going to show you how to break passwords. We'll break into a Unix system, learn how DeepCrack broke DES, meet John the Ripper, and I'll even extract the contents of a fully encrypted zip file right before your eyes. And after we break the easy stuff, we'll drag out a 192 core Threadripper with a half a terabyte of RAM and dual NVIDIA 6000 ADA GPUs to see how long it takes to break the hard stuff. Now, there are two common refrains in YouTube videos such as this one. The first is that you must be running Kali Linux for maximum hacking street cred. The other is that I'm about to make you into a super hacker by revealing some technology to you so powerful, so revolutionary that I have to caution you on its use. And there's some truth to that actually because I am going to show you the tools and techniques used by professionals and penetration testers needed to break into many systems. So these standard disclaimers do apply. You should only use systems in accordance with their acceptable use policies and never try to get access to something that you do not legally have the right to do. But if becoming the ultimate black hat hacker isn't the end goal here, then what's the point of learning how to break passwords? And besides maybe getting yourself back into that zip file that you lost the password to, what is the ultimate takeaway going to be? And the reality is that by learning how to break passwords, you quickly learn what kinds of passwords are the easiest to break, and you will intuitively begin to select more secure passwords. Because once I show you some of the various weaknesses that we're about to exploit, the odds are that you're going to want to run out and change a few of your own passwords right now. If nothing else, I can promise that by the time we're done today, you'll be far better equipped to protect your own security. And once you see how quickly I can break certain passwords, it might just scare you straight. One of the most fundamental things to understand about passwords on modern computer systems is that the computer almost never actually stores or even knows what your password actually is. It would, after all, be careless and dangerous to store your password on the machine since other administrators with full access would be able to see it as well. And that's why, in part, the computer will actually store what's known as a hash of the password. It's like a one-way door where you can push a password through it and a reasonably unique number pops out the other side. But you can't go backwards. So you run your password through this hash function and out pops a number and you store that number. And then when the user tries to log in, they will supply a password and that password will be run through the same hash function. And if the numbers match, you are then granted access. But what's a hash function? Well, let's explore a really simple example, and like most simple examples, it would be a terrible solution in practice, but should serve to illustrate how the principle works. Let's say that for any password, we just walk the string and sum up the values of the ASCII letters that make up the password. If the password is hello with an uppercase H, then the ASCII letters that represent hello are 72, 101, 108, 108, and 111. Our made up hash function will just sum the ASCII digits, giving us the number 500. And so we store the hash number of 500 alongside your username somewhere. And then the next time you enter your password, we sum the characters that you've entered as your password. And if your answer is also 500, you're in. Now, hopefully more than a few of you have spotted the fatal flaw in this approach. The order of the letters doesn't even matter here since hello backwards still sums to 500. In fact, not only do many different possible ASCII strings sum to 500, it's worse than that. It's pretty easy to make up a string that sums to 500. For example, instead of hello, what if the user enters quasi? We extract the letters and sum them up as follows. 81, 85, 65, 90, 90, and 89. And it also sums to 500. And that means you could log into the system by entering hello or quasi, which doesn't feel very secure. And that's because it is in fact not very secure at all, which is in turn because we've selected a hash function that is just too easy to spoof. We need a much more complicated one, one that takes ordering into account and so on, so that the odds of two strings having the same hash function is very low, and that the probability of being able to make up a string that hashes to any particular value is very, very low. Well, how are we going to make up our own secure hash function? Well, we're not going to. We're going to leave that to the math heads. You know, the people with the heads so big they have to be careful not to bump them as they go through doorways? Now, if there's one thing I learned while working on the original Windows product activation some 25 years ago, it's that the math heads work in a completely different world than the one I have access to. So I just trust them because I'm certainly not going to be able to do any better by myself. And that's a good time to throw out an old admonition about encryption. Never try to invent it yourself. I can't count the number of times that I've seen code where people are XORing with 255 to obscure some data. So please, just use a proper system call when you actually do need to encrypt something. But even that advice can be short-sighted at times, such as with crypt on Unix. On old Unix, a user can provide a password of any length, but only the first eight characters are significant, and the rest are ignored. Those eight characters are then used by the crypt algorithm to generate a 56-bit DES key, where DES stands for Data Encryption Standard. 
Back in the late 1970s, the data encryption standard was the gold standard of encryption. Approved by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, it was widely used to secure everything from corporate communications to government secrets. DES used a 56-bit key, which was considered robust at the time, given the computational resources available. It was believed that brute forcing all possible 56-bit keys, over 72 quadrillion combinations, would be infeasible for any attacker. That belief, as it turned out, would not stand the test of time. The seeds of doubt about DES's longevity were planted in the early 90s when computing power started catching up with the encryption's theoretical vulnerabilities. Researchers and cryptographic experts warned that DES's 56-bit key space, though massive by human standards, was alarmingly small for computers. It really wasn't so much a question of if DES could be cracked, but when. The first major warning shot came in 1997 when RSA Laboratories, as part of a public challenge, put up $10,000 for anybody who could break a DES encrypted message. A project led by cryptographer Ian Goldberg and the Distributed.net network managed to do it in 96 days using distributed computing, a collaborative effort that used idle CPUs across thousands of volunteers' computers. While impressive, it wasn't fast. For encryption skeptics, this was just a proof of concept, and the real shock came a year later. Enter the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, a digital rights group with a penchant for proving the practical limitations of cryptographic weaknesses. The EFF, concerned about privacy and government surveillance, decided to make a point. DES was not secure and it needed to be replaced. To do so, they built a machine specifically designed to brute force DES keys. Named DeepCrack, this custom hardware was built for just $250,000, a sum that was alarmingly affordable even for universities and corporations. More importantly, you didn't have to be a nation-state to afford it. DeepCrack was a brute-forcing powerhouse. It consisted of custom-designed chips capable of testing over 88 billion DES keys per second. By harnessing this power, DeepCrack could plow through the entire DES key space in about four days, although typical cases took less time on average. The demonstration was stark. DeepCrack successfully decrypted the challenge ciphertext, proving once and for all that DES's days were numbered. But the story didn't end there. To drive the point home, the EFF collaborated with Distributed.net. They combined the distributed computing resources of thousands of volunteers with the brute force speed of DeepCrack. Together, they cracked a DES encrypted message in just about 22 hours, obliterating any remaining confidence in 56-bit encryption. And the consequences were seismic. Banks, corporations, and governments that had relied on DES for decades scrambled to upgrade their systems. For Unix systems, where the DES algorithm had been widely used in tools like Password for hashing user credentials, the implications were direct. Login systems that had relied on DES hashed passwords were suddenly wide open to attacks by anybody with a moderately powerful computer and a little patience. Alternatives like MD5 and Bcrypt quickly gained popularity for password hashing as DES was phased out. The cracking of DES is a classic reminder that no encryption is forever. It's a game of cat and mouse where defenders must always stay a step ahead. And while DES served valiantly for over two decades, its downfall was a turning point, ushering in a new era of cryptographic awareness and innovation. So how long would it take us to break DES on a modern PC? And it's time to find out. And for that, it's also time to break out the AMD Threadripper 7995WX, complete with dual NVIDIA RTX 6000 ADA GPUs. Now the machine also has a half a terabyte of RAM and 48 gigabytes of video memory. How fast is it? Well, it's pretty damn fast. It's even faster than DeepCrack ever was. In fact, DeepCrack was able to produce about 88 billion hashes per second, whereas this PC can do on the order of 200 billion per second, so it's at least twice as fast. And that leaves two big questions. How are we going to do all this password hashing, and where are we going to get the hashes in the first place? Well, starting with the first question, we're going to run a ripper on the ripper. Which is to say, we're going to run a software package called John the Ripper on the AMD Threadripper. And John the Ripper was designed precisely for that, offline attacks against hashes. What's the difference between an online attack and an offline attack? Well, that's where the answer to the second question about where to get the hash comes in. You see, an online attack means that you're actively trying to log into the system using a combination of password guesses, whether you're typing them into a login prompt or blasting a port on a server somewhere with 10,000 requests a second. The point is the server knows or should know that you're doing it. But with an offline attack, you just have a copy of the hash of the password, and now we're going to try to guess what the original password was that led to that hash. Once we have it, we can just log in successfully the first time. But this all still begs the question, where do you get the hashes to attack? 
Well, in the case of Unix systems, there's actually a file stored in plain text on the system called etc slash password, and it contains a list of usernames and attributes. And in really, really old Unix, it also contained the hashes of the passwords too. But eventually, people figured out that having the hashes visible to everybody was probably a bad idea, so they moved them to a second file that was only readable by root. But there's still a problem, one best served by a short story about stealing my best friend's passwords. About 25 years ago, he was running an online multi-user dungeon community that was based on some custom software that he'd written to run atop Unix. And, for some completely valid and temporary reason that I can't remember the specifics of now, he gave me root access for a little bit to do some tasks that only root could do. And, drunk with power, I went and grabbed a copy of the master password file with the hashes in it. I was curious. I'd never been root before. I wanted to see it. And then I used the most powerful computer I had access to at the time, a MIPS R4400 workstation with dual 100 MHz CPUs and 32 MB of RAM. I wrote code to perform what's known as an offline dictionary attack, and within something like two days, it had kicked out the passwords of about a dozen of their users, two of whom were root. Curiosity got the best of me again, and I telnetted into the system. I entered the username and password of one of the compromised accounts, and it dropped me to a command prompt instantly. So what did I do? I panicked. I pressed Control-D, and I got the hell out of there, and I never logged in again. I mean, it was my best friend's server. What did you expect me to do? RM-FR from the root? Now, I hope there are a couple of you out there questioning this story. I mean, something doesn't add up on first blush. This was back in the late 90s, about the same time as DeepCrack, so if it took four days for DeepCrack to work through the entire DES key space, how did I crack one in half the time? And the answer is that I didn't crack the entire key space. My code used a dictionary of English words, and for each word it would try variations, like capitalizing the first letter, adding a digit or exclamation mark to the end, and so on. All the various things people tend to do. Because remember, I wasn't trying to match some randomly selected ASCII password. I was attacking a list of real people's passwords, and people tend to use words in their passwords. And that is the first lesson. Never use English words or words from any language in your password. Because while DeepCrack had to sort through quadrillions of combinations to find a truly random password, I only had to work through a few million at best to match the people who'd used English words in their passwords. And of course, there's nothing special about English. You want to avoid anything you can find on a list anywhere. If you can find it on a list somewhere, that list can be fed into a hashing program, and odds are that it already has, and out will pop your password. And that could be a list of foreign words, acronyms, technical terms, a list of previously compromised passwords, or pretty much anything. And to be really precise here, I don't just mean to avoid making your password a whole word. I mean, don't use any words anywhere within your password, even if you add numbers and punctuation before and after them. And combining them with other words only makes it marginally harder to break. Now, to try it for ourselves, there are two ways that you can run John the Ripper. The easiest is just install it using a package manager or from the releases page on GitHub. And I'll put links in the video description so you can get it for yourself. And for the vast majority of your hacking, that will suffice. But since the machine we'll be using has some powerful GPUs, I want to take advantage of them, and that requires the jumbo version of John. To get that version, you need to enlist in the source code, build, and configure it yourself. So once we've cloned the source code, we just go into the source folder and run the dot slash configure script, which will create a make file appropriate for our machine. Now, the configure process goes through and evaluates your environment, crafting a make file to match it, and this will take some minutes. When it's done, we can run a make clean and then make the actual source code. To do our first experiment with John, I've copied the Unix password file into the run folder where John lives. With that, we simply launch John password and we'll get to work cracking our passwords. The program is smart enough to figure out what kind of hash it's dealing with and will adjust automatically. And the amazing thing to me is that it kicks out the banana 7 password in under a second. And a second or two later, we get Happy Boy, our first root password. Shortly after, it kicks out Vector Ma, which was probably Vector Man, and Red Light, and 12 Dave. How is it able to hit these so quickly? Well, again, it's using a dictionary attack. It starts with a dictionary word list that is provided with John, and then attacks the hash using variations on each of these words, adding letters and numbers to flesh out the possibilities. The one thing it didn't find is my own password, and that's because by standard practice, I don't use any known words in my password. That means we won't be successful with the dictionary attack, and we need to try an incremental attack. That's an attack much like trying to crack your old combination lock by starting with 000, and then 001, and 002, and so on. But instead of just three digits, it's got to find eight random ASCII characters. To do that effectively, we're going to employ the GPUs in this machine because certain kinds of hashing, including DES hashing, are well suited to the GPU and can be done in a massively parallel fashion. To get John to use the GPUs, we'll specify a format of deescrypt-opencl. We'll also tell it to use an incremental attack and to fork into two copies. 
That will cause John to launch two instances of itself and split the workload between them. The key there is that it then allows each John process access to its own entire GPU. Once we launch it, we can wait. And wait. If we take a look at the GPU activity graph with NVTOP, we can see alternating spikes to 100% going back and forth between the GPUs. And we can keep on waiting, but it's going to take a while. Rest assured though, it cracked it. It did take overnight, but when I came out the next morning, it was sitting at the prompt proudly after coughing out my complex password. Now let's try something a little more practical than breaking into an old Unix system, like cracking the encryption on a standard zip file. First, I'll create my secret payload message in a text editor, just saying this is my secret message. Then I'll save that out as secret.txt. Next, I'll add it to a new zip file called secret.zip. I'll turn on encryption with the dash E flag, which will cause zip to prompt me for a password. I'll supply and confirm a reasonably secure password, 10 characters in total, a mix of six characters and four digits. To extract the needed hash, I'll run a helper program provided with John called zip to john which will produce a hash that I'll turn directly into a new file called a zip password. To start the cracking process, I'll launch John on this new password file. And we don't have to wait very long. In fact, at the 25 second mark, it produces the password, banana1492, that I had used to secure the zip file. So what have we learned from all this? Well, a lot, actually. After seeing these tools in action, it should be crystal clear why certain password practices are absolutely critical. First, as I said, was to never use dictionary words in your passwords, even if you think you're being clever by combining them with other things. We saw how quickly John the Ripper was able to tear through those kinds of passwords. A password like Happy Boy or Banana 7 might feel secure, but it's child's play for modern cracking tools. Second, raw computing power has made many older encryption methods obsolete. What took deep crack days can now be done by a single high-end PC in a couple hours. And this is why we need to constantly evolve our security practices and update our systems. Third, and this might be surprising, length matters more than complexity. A truly random eight character password might seem secure, but as we saw with our Threadripper demonstration, it can still be brute forced in a matter of hours. You're much better off with a longer passphrase that's truly random than a shorter one with special characters. But the most important lesson is this. The tools and techniques that I've shown you today aren't some dark magic. They're the same tools that security professionals use to test and verify system security. Understanding how passwords can be broken is crucial for learning how to protect them. And that's really the point of this, not to become elite hackers, but to understand why good security practices matter. Because once you've seen a password cracked in seconds that you thought was secure, well, it tends to change your perspective on security pretty quickly. If you've enjoyed today's password cracking adventures, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes. So please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Please be sure to turn on the bell icon so you get reminders of my random release schedule. If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, link in the video description. It's everything I know now about living your best life on the spectrum that I wish I would known long ago. And be sure to check out our weekly podcast called Shop Talk and hosted on the Dave's Attic channel. Not this channel, so you have to go to the other channel to get it. Since we're hosting it on the second channel, not many people wind up seeing it yet, but I'm hoping you're going to find it worth looking into in the video description, or just search for Dave's Attic where you'll find the latest episode. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Woo!